Good evening, folks, and welcome once more to the Safe Ed for All show, episode six now. And this week we're discussing health and safety aspects of returning to school. Schools, of course, do not just consist of the pupils. There are plenty of adults working there, too, from the teachers to the office staff to the numerous ancillary and support roles. They are extremely busy workplaces. So little wonder they have been the main driver of COVID in society and why the lack of mitigations, lack of vaccination, lack of any preventative measures whatsoever by the government over the summer, whilst the schools have been closed, let's remember, is all the more stupefying. Discussing this with me tonight from Safe Ed, we are joined by Lisa Diaz and Claire Kosler. And from the Hazards <laughs> Campaign, a health and safety advocacy group, though I'll get her to talk a little bit more about the Hazard Campaign's work presently. Our special guest tonight is Hilda Palmer. Welcome, one and all. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And it's very good to hear a Cornish accent. Yes, isn't it just? Ah! We don't them on the TV or on the media, do us. No, well, I, 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 I've been told I have a lovely Cornish brogue, so... Uh, you do. I come from the South Hams myself, but unfortunately, via London and Zambia and the North West, I tend, I've really lost. So I, I'll probably, if I lapse into a cod South West accent, you'll have to forgive me. Well, my, my mother was born in, well, my mother was born in Stockport and uh, my right. wife's from Hertfordshire, so mine, <laughs> mine gets a little bit muddled at times, but, uh, you know, we make do. We've got a wonderful country full of lovely accents. Now, as all always we'll start with a bit of an update from safe ed as to what's been happening over the last week and what they've been up to so lisa claire who would like to start on that please go lisa, on, claire, do you want to you come in first or no right, you I'll... go first go all on. right go on, uh, on. well one of the main things this week has been we've been looking for a long time for some legal support to bring some kind of case to court against the government. We've, we've explored various avenues. We've been rejected on various avenues. And this week, one of the parents from Safe Ed was actually answered by Joe Morm from the Good Law Campaign, who said, do you want our help? At which well, point, a whole group of parents burst out crying, me included. Hmm. Um, Joe obviously has a proven track record of challenging the government on everything from Brexit to proroguing Parliament. So to have Joe on our side would be absolutely amazing. So we um, shield us, the Hazard Campaign and various other groups are liaising with him to get a dossier together for him. That's been our bit of good news. That's huge. Yeah. Lisa? Uh, Lisa? Lisa? Oh, sorry, yeah. me. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, no, just uh, reiterating what, what Claire said, it's, it's abs it, you know, we're, we're really, really hopeful. Um, everything crossed. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, what else has happened? Um, a few of my little videos have, have um, taken off, which has mm. is, is been, is been wonderful, really overwhelming, really nice. Um, and so I've, I've done a, an interview with, with the BBC, um, radio and television, um, and a couple of other radio um, interviews as well. Also, um, Mike Galsworthy has got in touch, and he oh, wants yeah. to do. Yeah, he he's uh, he said about um, sending um, either like a film crew up and doing some interviews with me and talking it because you know it, it's it's very much of the moment now as well. I mean, we've been fighting like for eighteen months, but now it's like you know it's the crux of the matter, isn't it? Schools are going back, so hopefully I'm going to do something with him and Byline Times next week as well. So. Honestly, I'm just anybody who wants to talk to me from anywhere. I'm just banging the drum as loudly as I possibly can. As many of us as phone. possible, I think. We're all do not just yeah. we, absolutely. We're all you know. We're all doing our best. Um, I was in um, a, a, a web seminar the other night. It was um, uh, Hilda. I think you you came. Uh, you were there as well, weren't you? <laughs> watching. And I got to ask the panel um, a question, and I was asking him about schools. Um, and his name is Professor Michael Baker. That's Baker. the one. Yes, thank you, Professor Michael Baker. And he's an epidemiologist who advises the New Zealand government. And he explained what was what was happening. And, you know, kids are going back, like Damo said, we all know, no mitigations, no vaccinations, various things that the government are doing to help spread the, the, the virus in schools, like assemblies, not um, the, the close contacts, they're, they're not being isolating anymore, things like that. And his actual words, I wrote it down, was that the government and Boris Johnson was conducting a barbaric experiment on the British people. Mm -hmm. So that was, it's kind of, it's kind of what you know, but it's good not to be gaslighted. Mm -hmm. 
Do you know what I mean? When you've got like a top epidemiologist from New Zealand telling, saying it's it's a barbaric experiment on the British people and talking about, you know, the, the real dangers of COVID, not just on adults, but in children as well. It just, uh, it's, it's good to hear that. On the same time, it's absolutely gutting because, because it is. I think the difficulty is also that uh, we get so much gaslighting here that when, I mean, you know, like some of us, like you said, some of us have spoken to media this week and some of it's been international media. And when they're actually speaking to you and not gaslighting you and listening to what you're saying and yeah. supporting what you're saying after 18 months of us shouting into the void and yeah. British paediatricians going, oh, no, no, it's just like the flu. And then people are going, no, it's really serious. You're absolutely oh. right. Two it's children have nice died. Be- Seriously? Two children have died More, in the past yeah. 24 hours. Two ten yeah. to it's in the ten to nineteen bracket. Yeah. You know what? What more do you need to say? And yeah. I don't like this attitude about oh well, it's very few children that die. No children should be dying because it's entirely preventable. What's happening? And it's not just yeah. dying, is it? I've got some. No. I've got some news from a big French study, which I I will catch you up with after Hilda has spoken to us for a bit. Um, yeah. And that is about long COVID in children. And that is pretty serious findings as well. So, yeah. Yeah, the um, it, it's been quite a, a, a marketed um, point that's been made this week in the media that it's been reported that Boris Johnson is seeing a thousand deaths a week as an acceptable number to keep the country open. And you do have to wonder just what kind of a person considers that arbitrary number uh, an acceptable number, really, uh, and they could be from any age groups. He doesn't care. Uh, he, I guarantee he puts a, a, a higher value on his own life. Um, but I, I, you know, anybody watching this, I would have to say, you know, if he's saying this and, you know, a thousand deaths a week, is that your mum, dad, grandparents, children? I mean, if it's a member of your family, is that an acceptable death for the sake of the economy? Um, mm. Because this is this is the the way they're building their strategy. Um, and I have to say, you look at the, the COVID stats and the, the, you know, the, the daily death figures, which, of course, are becoming um, more and more serious each day. And you're looking, well, OK, a thousand deaths a week. This week, we're up uh, something like 767 deaths. Yeah, as it's not going to take long. No. And well, the schools no. are, you know, the vast majority of schools are still not open. We yeah. know where this is going. And we've seen what's sorry, Jay. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, we've seen what's going on in Scotland. They went back on the sixteenth of August, and cases have already risen by three hundred percent there from the sixteenth of August. Yeah. And they've got mass in secondary schools. So yeah, like you said, you know, you, you, you don't have to be uh, a sidekick or Mystic Meg to see where this what's going to happen in in a week or so in England. No, but we will uh, we will keep an eye on that. Obviously, we're now what something about a week or so, just over a week now before, at the time of recording, anyway, so before the uh, the schools return. So, yeah, it's not going to be long before we start to see what what exactly um, the damage is going to be because there doesn't seem to be any deterring them at this moment in time. But it is really positive, actually. Let's find a positive in everything we've just said. That you know. Leading figures, uh, scientists such as Mike Goldsworthy, uh, lawyers such as Jolly and Morm, they're picking this up. These are mm. big figures on social media, uh, mm. people with an outstanding reputation, and they are picking this issue up now, and they are drawing more attention to it. And that's great, because that ultimately is what we've sought to do here from the very beginning, is to raise the profile of what is going on, to say, no, there are parents out here who are not accepting this. We're not going to put up with this nonsense. We're not just going to let the government walk all over us. We're here and we're, we're, we've got voices and we're, we're, we're going to be heard. And of course, we on Socialist Telly have given you fantastic uh, people uh, a platform to do so, and you've run with it. And now, like you, you know, Times Radio, um, <laughs> you, were saying, <laughs> yeah, you were saying LBC are coming up to interview you, Claire. Um, you know, it is gathering momentum. You, you can't argue. Okay, you can argue about the, you know, some of these sources, perhaps, but at least they're putting that they're listening. And if they're going to cover it, and I know you guys are going to do your thing as you do oh so well and you're going to make your points and you're not going to take any nonsense from them and yeah i hope they uh, report honestly on it but we shall see won't we yes right. indeed. 
now our special guest tonight is Hilda Palmer from the Hazards Campaign. Welcome, Hilda. Now, for those, who haven't, for those who haven't heard about Hazards, could you tell us a little bit about you and the work you do? Uh, the Hazards Campaign is a, is a national network of organisations that work around uh, workers' health and safety around specific issues like asbestos, uh, construction safety, pesticides, you know, a whole range of issues. And there are small groups all over the country who are doing this sort of work. And we come together, we've been in existence for, I don't know, about 33 years, 1987. Um, our, the magazine is, uh, Hassel's magazine is produced by Rory O'Neill in in Sheffield, a quarterly, which is absolutely incredible, covering all the issues you could possibly want to know about in terms of workers' health and safety. And we run an annual hazards campaign. We're on about our, I can't remember what we're on about, our 32nd, I think. Um, and every 28th of April, we run International Workers Memorial Day, which is now a massive worldwide uh, campaign to remember all the people who've died at work and to fight like hell for the living because nobody dies in a tragic accident that you couldn't foresee and couldn't prevent and nobody dies of rare illnesses while well, we're dealing with you know what we're talking about at the moment with covid nobody dies of rare illnesses that nobody could do anything about people die at work and in during, during covid because employers didn't care enough to comply with the law and governments didn't make them. And that's why it happens. And 50,000 people die every year because of past work conditions. 1,500 are killed in work-related incidents, including suicides, deaths on the road in air and sea. Th these are huge, huge figures. That's 140 people every day. 140 people every day. And the only thing that will save us is unions, workers working together collectively, trade union workplaces are twice as safe. We know that. And so we work across all of these issues. We campaign on all of them. We campaign for better health and safety. We campaign against the deregulation of health and safety, the slashing of enforcement budgets, the anti-trade union laws, um, and for better compensation, better treatment of workers and families, and, and all the rest of it. And I also run a group called... Families Against Corporate Killers, FAC, which is um, a group that has worked with hundreds of families who get the terrible news that somebody they waved off to work that morning isn't ever coming home again because some employer didn't give a damn about them and they've died in a work-related incident. And we help those people to get as much justice as they possibly can. So that's probably enough about us. And obviously, we've been working very hard during COVID trying to support all sorts of groups, but all sorts of individuals helping people to get more health and safety in their workplaces, um, campaigning against the government's negligence, criminal negligence. We think they're social murderers, that their actions are equivalent to corporate manslaughter and they should be held completely to account. We, um, we do a huge amount of general uh, inquiry work. We do a huge amount of, we'd have Thursday uh, webinars, web, Zoom meetings where we talk about all the, all the different issues. We do lots of training on this. And we've said right from the very beginning what the causes are that COVID is airborne and therefore we must control it by ventilation and layered preventions. And we've said very clearly that, you know, we must only go back to work when it's safe. We, we are part of the zero COVID campaign because that's the only possible way to go. You can't live with it. Living with it Boris Johnson living with COVID means the rest of us dying and suffering from it. And, th and that's the real point. We, we, we challenge them on all their science and on the fact that it's a the false dichotomy that it has to be health or the economy. That's absolute rubbish. The, the, the countries which have taken a zero COVID and elimination of suppression approach are doing far better in terms of their economies and have had far more freedom than, than we've had here. And all of this, this chaos and this disruption and the terrible treatment of people has, of course, borne in most heavily on all the people who suffer the most anyway. Health and safety is a matter of inequality. The lower your wage, the more likely you are to live in polluted environments, to live in the worst housing. You're more likely to go to work in filthy air, for your kids to go to work in polluted air, and for you yourself to work in polluted air. You're more likely to die at work, be injured at work, and you're more likely, you know, you'll live a shorter, less healthy life. So it was before COVID and so it has been with COVID. And when you add in ethnicity and sex and disability and all the other inequalities, it becomes even more toxic. Yeah. So that's really what we are and what we do. 
Yeah, living with COVID, it's it's a brilliant phrase, isn't it? Living with COVID, unless you're one of the poor souls, some 150,000 people today yeah. who weren't able to live with it because it killed them. And yeah. it is offensive in the extreme for anybody to carry on saying we need to live with COVID. You cannot live with it. It's just, it keeps on evolving. It keeps on changing. And all the mitigations we've, that have been developed, such as vaccinations, become less and less effective the longer this knocks on. Um, the 140 deaths a day figure you mentioned, was that before COVID? Is that just Yes, really yes, yes. Oh, that's before COVID. No, no, that doesn't include any of the COVID figures. That's, that's before so. COVID. And that, no. that's the point, though. So you, people don't realise that. And that before we came into COVID, the health and safety system in Britain had been, has been broken by decades of deregulation and underfunding of enforcement and by 10 years of Tory misrule in terms of deregulating it, political interference and cutting the budget of the enforcement agencies, the HSE and the local authorities by more than 50% and preventing them from actually doing their job. So yes, that was what was happening before COVID. Wow, you, you you think about deaths on that sort of a scale, a daily scale, and you're thinking, well, I'm sure I'm from Cornwall. I'm thinking days of tin mining and stuff like that, for example. That that kind of the, those sorts of figures were from that sort of yesteryear, but no, it's still going on to this day. It's my dad worked in construction. Crazy. My dad worked in construction, and construction was worse than what when he worked when he began to work in it. One of the most killer industries. And mm. uh, he worked on the Thames Barrier, and to the point I think where he joined the site, which was quite early on. There were already thirteen deaths on site, mm. yeah. um, and it was actual taking of health and safety laws and the the, the strengthening of health and safety enforcement that turned that round in the construction Absolutely. industry. But what we're seeing, as Hilda's just said, is it all being turned back? Yes, I, I mean, it, it, that is absolutely right. When I first started this work 30 odd years ago, our, our formal HSE death figures were well over 700 a year um, in terms of incidents. I mean, now they're down to about 140, but they don't count half of the deaths and they don't count and report all of the illnesses and things like that. And we did used to have about 60 construction deaths a year. Even during the Labour government, we had to have a safety summit with Peter Hain and, and, and Prescott and all those sort of things. Some of those deaths have some of those deaths have decreased very much because of all the work and the campaigning that has actually been done. But deaths due to um, stress and all sorts of other chemicals and all sorts of other uh, problems have sort of gone on in the background. Work-related ill health has, has increased massively. And we know that about 10% of suicides, that's about 650 people a year, are due to work-related problems because work has become so hellish. Workloads are impossible. Targets are impossible. Work hours are long. And you don't even, the, the money you get doesn't even pay the bills. So there are all those sort of things. And then rowing back on health and safety by saying it's a burden on business, it's an albatross, it's a millstone, it's it's killing off business. It's all a lie, but it's been used to drive back business. And that has that's the background into which COVID has come. And that is partly why we are in the mess we are in, because the HSE has been so it's a watchdog that's had its teeth extracted. It's a poodle, it's a government poodle, and it has stepped back from all of this, and it is not enforcing health and safety law. It's not enforcing, it's not prosecuting, it's persuading employers not to report illnesses, infections and deaths. So we have an incredible situation. They classify COVID as a significant work risk, not a serious work risk. And that simple change has changed the whole way in which they can enforce it. And they're standing back standing behind Public Health England. They've not stepped in and said, health workers must have proper PPE. They've stood behind, it's okay to wear uh, fluid resistant surgical masks, which as we know are only, are only good for preventing droplets getting out. They don't prevent um, aerosols from getting out and they are not PPE. They have presided over 1500 healthcare worker deaths. They presided over, we don't know, 8,000 worker deaths, more, we don't know because they don't bloody count them. And they're standing back and they're doing nothing. They've said almost nothing about schools. Schools are workplaces. They enforce in schools. They have said nothing. They have abandoned workers. They've gone AWOL. They have abandoned workers completely 
to code along it. with the EHRC. The EHRC as well should be intervening for for you know this sorry the EHRA should be intervening for disabled workers and they're not and with that that double edged sword. There's no protections from either end of the spectrum, are there? No. No. Well, um, I don't know if you've caught a story in the mirror today since uh, we've, we've come onto this subject, really. Um, they've done a, an interview with the new General Secretary of Unite, Sharon Graham, who was talking about how she got into trade unionism herself. And that was after her uncle was killed through an accident at work. So um, it, it does kind of uh, lend itself very much to uh, what you've been saying, uh, Hilda, and it certainly has inspired some to do go on to do some great things. I hope we see some great things from Sharon Graham. Uh, obviously, you guys do work with the trade union movement a lot. Um, the changes need to be made. You've you've drawn them up into uh, a manifesto. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about what changes are needed? What what you've put into your manifesto and what that what is needed compared to what is already in place or or isn't in place as the case may be okay quite a lot of things i'll try i'll try and be quite brief but what we need we know what works to make work safer and that is strong laws strictly enforced and strong active trade unions and those three pillars are what has been attacked and undermined viciously by the tory government over the last 10 years and that's you know, exacerbated the mess that we're actually in, although there was problems before that. And I wouldn't say that the Labour government, apart from in its first term, actually did anything terribly good and sufficient. Um, so what, what needs to happen is to reinforce all of those. So we need stronger laws. We need a range of stronger laws. We need the repeal of all the anti-trade union laws. We need support of trade unions. We need to have safety reps in every workplace. Uh, we need, obviously, changes to employment law so that all workers are you know, have health and safety rights, whatever their so-called employment status right from day one, all those sort of things. Uh, and then we need, uh, you know, much more funding for the enforcement of this so that um, employers who don't comply with the, the, the laws, the stronger strengthened laws, are actually properly prosecuted. Um, inspections have fallen massively because since the Tory party ban pro proactive preventative inspections. Um, prosecutions have gone down, enforcement notices have gone down to the extent that literally the majority of people, if you're not in a trade union, if you work in the gig economy, for example, you haven't got a hope in hell of getting your right to a safe and healthy workplace enforced. So we also you know, want a lot of increased in rights for, uh, rights for safety reps and for workers. Um, and and you know, we, we lay them out quite carefully. I won't go through all the detail of it, but that there are a lot of things in there that if they were if they were done would make an enormous difference to um, everybody's experience of, of work. But every worker should have access to a safety route in their workplace and should be aware of their rights and how to actually try to get them enforced. But there must be a proper strong mechanism and a strong enforcement agency that's not politically interfered with. We'd want, uh, we have workers representatives on the board of the HSE but the, the tripartite working where you have employers, uh, employees and the government, that's been very much undermined. We want that much more strengthened and we want representatives of families of workers who've been killed, uh, families of people, who, workers who've been made ill by work. The people who know what the cost, what the cost benefit of good health and safety law and enforcement is. We want those people on the board. And I should just tell you, I applied recently to become one of the general members of the HSE board, but I was turned down. I didn't get the chance to do that. So I'm looking forward to see who's actually who's actually got it. But obviously they didn't want someone like me there. Mm. Well, you've been particularly scathing over the actions of the HSC, the Health and Safety Executive. As you've already said, this is a government agency. It is part of the government. Its current chair is the former Tory MP for Truro and Falmouth, Sarah Newton. So Absolutely. So perhaps its weakness, its failures are not so surprising, given they're all in it together. Absolutely. Um, she was at the DWP. She was actually in oh, charge yeah. of the HSE when the Tory government was slashing and cutting it. And she's been put there, you know, with that in mind. And have you heard anything at all from her during COVID? Absolutely not. 
no, no. Um, yes, sadly, with uh, so many of the Cornish Tory MPs, you you don't really hear very much of them at all um, doing very much of anything, frankly. Certainly not anything uh, to benefit people. Um, but it's so, you know, its failures are not particularly surprising given they're supposed to be holding the Tory government to account, keeping them informed. And, well, they, they just put their own in charge, don't they? So it's been rendered toothless with pro-government figures put in those places at the top. And I'm sure she's on a very nice wage to do it as well. Oh, yes. What do you really need from the HSC? What changes do you need made by them and with them? And what should they be doing right now? Well, right now, they should be treating COVID as, as what it is, which is an occupational illness. And they should be acting proactively in workplaces to try and um, assiduously prevent transmission of COVID by all its mechanisms. And that primarily is, of course, airborne. COVID is in the air and we should be cleaning the air by ventilation, by filtration and by preventing the aerosols that people exhale that can contain COVID if someone's infected, by preventing them from getting into the air, by making people wear decent, good fit, good filtration masks, which actually reduce the viral load in the air. So they reduce the percentage of, of COVID that people can inhale. And ventilation must be massively improved. Every, there should be at least 10 litres per second per person, um, or the equivalent of, well, we were saying four to six changes of air a, an hour per room. But now in, in America, the um, ASHRA, the uh, ventilation organization, they've actually said that six should be the minimum. They're now calling for more than six. And if you have got poor ventilation, then we have to consider things like portable HEPA filters, very, very fine filters, which filter out small particles that can contain COVID. And those together, if you have masks alone, you can reduce the amount of virus in the air by about 70%. If you have HEPA filtration, you can reduce it by 65%. And together, you can reduce it by 90%. So that won't eliminate totally the chance of somebody getting uh, COVID, but it will massively reduce the risk of inhaling it. And then other things like distancing, obviously cleaning and stuff like that. But the main thing really is to is to follow the control hierarchy. They should be enforcing this and they are not, which is we must eliminate, you eliminate a hazard. So you stop people who are infected from going to work by making sure that they're properly paid and they can stay at home and they have support. That You have to do that. We have to make sure that people who are contacts are allowed to stay home until they can prove that they are actually not infected and they have to be supported. So we have to have proper test trace isolate and support systems. And we don't have them because we squandered billions of pounds on Dido Hastings and God only knows what she spent it on. And that system has almost completely collapsed. But we have to have that. And at the moment that's being undermined. So they have to get on top of this. They have to see the workplace as somewhere where COVID is spread because people are coming together and where that can be stopped. They are not doing that they're standing back and saying it's not the workplace it's because people share cars people share cars because there wasn't any public transport because they get paid so little they have to share cars they can't afford to do that all sorts of reasons or it's not the work it's because they congregate during their breaks they wouldn't be congregating during their breaks if they weren't at work it's work and they're not accepting that and they're hiding behind it and they're not investigating outbreaks they're not stopping them they're not doing anything to protect workers. So we'd want them to step up and to, to fulfill their mission, which is to prevent illness, injury and death at work. We want them to do their job. Not too hard, really. No. Well, last week we had a chap called Andrew Hobbs on. He's a ventilation and air quality solution provider, where we discussed the fact that the virus is airborne, as you've just said, and for a long time the government were ignoring this. We discussed the fact that many public buildings, including schools, are constructed in such a way as to encourage the virus to linger and propagate that actually, even pre-COVID, this was an issue. Since yes, oh, also definitely. Be, 
you know, it also encourages, you know, it's viruses yes. such as the colds and flu, the number of yes. hours lost, work hours lost due to sick days, and all yes. this was actually preventable. And, yes. you know, you, you have written yourself on ventilation. You, yes. I, I'm not going to preach to you. You know far more on the issue than I do. But it seems to me as an airborne virus, this is the single biggest issue in the school environment. And aside yes. from vaccination, would be yes. the most important mitigation measure that could be taken. In fact, Andrew was talking about technologies that are some 20 years old. I've got the word written down here, photohydroionization. I don't know if you've come across that one. Yes. Basically, the, the, the technology exists that um, these filters yes. that these companies make can be installed into ventilation systems and they will kill yes. the virus in the air before people yes. can even breathe it in. Yes. Why yes. on earth is this in have we well, I asked Andrew the, the question last week. Why have we never even heard of this technology? Mm. Let alone why is the government not even considering it as an option to to help? So those us? those are all very very good questions. Uh, questions questions for the prosecution when the bastards come to court. I think <laughs> the the issue really the issue is why haven't you heard about it? And why we haven't heard about it is that almost everything that goes on at work, all the horrors that go on at work, apart from when we see them, and we've seen them more due to COVID, or we see them when they're absolutely terrible, you know, when you hear about what goes on at Amazon and things like that. But what's been going, goes on at workplaces and what workers are subjected to is pretty horrific, but very much hidden and invisible behind, you know, the factory or the office gates. And the fact is, as you say, you're absolutely right. It's all preventable and having good, healthy buildings would be fantastic. Uh, uh, ventilation was a huge, huge issue before this. For 30 years, I've spent an enormous amount of my time on queries from workers in all sorts of workplaces, which are basically about absolutely awful ventilation, sealed buildings, sick bin building syndrome, the whole, the whole rate of it. And when I, had, I was in an, a webinar with a, an, an HSE inspector, a TUC webinar with a thousand people on it. And she said, oh yes, well, we all know about ventilation now, but we didn't really talk about it much before. And I thought, well, why the hell weren't you? We were all talking about it. And workers, school teachers, colleges, universities fought like hell for years with the HSE to enforce better standards in the, work, in the workplace. And the HSE used the get out that, well, most of the people in schools aren't workers, so it's not really our problem. Despite yes. the fact that the Health and Safety at Work Act covers workers and people who are affected. So they did nothing. Good ventilation would have stopped colds, viruses, uh, fungal infections, all the filth and dirt that's in the air from things that, that are produced at work. It would have had an absolutely enormous, enormous effect. I should just tell you, there's a building in Salford where it's a six story building and it was a bit, pretty much a disgrace well before COVID. And there's a big sort of fight over it. The HSE wouldn't act. A heating, uh, air conditioning and ventilation um, specialist found that there was hardly any air getting into the building. It was a seven story building and it's only got trickle bricks, holes in the wall, which were basically, most of them were blocked up. And on one floor, there are 100, around 100 workstations. During COVID, there was a skeleton staff of about 20 in there. Even when they measured the airflow, it was only fit for about 18. Now, that's not unusual. I were, I've talked to people who, who are working in buildings where the air vents are black with, with, with mold, where the carpets are, are full of mold, where everybody in the building is suffering from an upper and lower respiratory tract disorder and their employers are basically doing nothing about it. And the HSE and the local authorities are not making them. And, and it, we wouldn't be in this state. What you were talking about, that particular um, ionization and um, ultraviolet germicidal treatments and whatever, those are great and you can do them at source if you've got a proper heating and air conditioning and ventilation system. You can do them at source and they can be infected. Or you can use upper room uh, ultraviolet uh, ventilation above above about seven feet but anything when people start talking about purifying the air or ionizing or all these sorts of things at a lower level steer clear these are snake this is snake oil to oil talk we have to be careful of that we don't want any of that lots of that puts more dangerous substances into the air and or it isn't really effective the most effective thing is HEPA filters just to suck the air through filter out the aerosols and put the air back 
and don't mess about with it. So don't go down the whole purification and ozone treatment and ionization and all that sort of nonsense. Most of that's rubbish. It's not regulated, but we do know that it can be potentially harmful. So just think about filtration. But some of those other treatments at source up within the systems of, of sucking the air in and filtering it and then putting it, yes, that can work and can be okay when it's done by competent people. Well, thank you for that. It's certainly uh, a debate to be had over uh, over ventilation uh, methodology, I should imagine. But uh, yes, it's certainly uh, bringing up that conversation. It's time that it was a debate that was had because clearly ventilation measures, mm -hmm. as things stand in buildings these days, are not sufficient, haven't been for a long, long time. And the COVID uh, crisis is really bringing it into sharp contrast. Now, obviously, this show is specific to the issues surrounding schools, and we have a complete lack of any mitigations being put in place other than the vaccination rollout to adults although the idea of vaccinating over 12s is rumored to be under discussion at the moment however with almost all new cases being the delta variant now it's 60 percent more transmissible than the original strain and with cases on the rise once more the chances of further new strains emerging and the efficacy of the vaccines in the long term becomes more questionable already boosters are being considered how hazardous is the school environment right now as kids prepare to return to school. Some obviously have already. Very, very, very hazardous. Absolutely. And there wouldn't be any way under health and safety law, employers have to carry, have to provide a workplace as free from health and safety and welfare risks to their employees as possible. And they have to do that by carrying out suitable and sufficient risk assessments. And if there are risks, they, they have to reduce those risks, eliminate them or reduce them as far as possible. And that is not what's being applied to schools. At the moment, as you said, I think, I think now that the thinking is that um, Delta is twice as transmissible. It also doubles the risk of hospitalization. Vaccinations are good for preventing hospitalization and serious illness, but they do not prevent transmission, but they will be important in the long run. I think there is quite a move to get 12 year olds vaccinated because that would help to prevent um, a, a lot of illness, but schools at the moment are not safe. The situation is that we have 26 times as much infection with this more transmissible virus, more hazardous variant than we had last term or last year this time, but they've taken away all the mitigations and they haven't put any new ones in place. So that's really, really incredibly important. I forgot to mention the issue about how do you measure ventilation? Well, there should be competent people to measure it and show that it's doing, it's, it's providing the flow that's needed. But one of the ways you can make it visible is CO2 monitors, which are a proxy because you breathe out carbon dioxide. So the more carbon dioxide in the air, that means the more exhaled air, the more you're likely to inhale someone else's aerosols. And we would recommend, and we have been recommended right from the beginning, that people use, um, that schools and government provides CO2 monitors and the level is kept below 800 parts per million. Okay, so those, those are the things. But at the moment, I would say that the risk of for teachers and children in schools is unacceptably high. And anybody, any competent occupational health specialist going into a school that hadn't improved its ventilation to that level, couldn't show that it could get the CO2 levels down, show that that's happening, wasn't having mandatory good masks in class and everywhere else, eating outside, distancing, all those sorts of things. PPE at FFP2 or FFP3 standard for all staff, for all children who are clinically vulnerable or CEV, um, if, it, if you couldn't have that, all those sorts of things, then I would say that those schools, that the risk was far too high. Lisa, do I bring you in? Yeah, um, thanks very much, Hilda. It's, it's absolutely fascinating listening to you. I feel like, you know, we learned so much from you. I, I want to ask you, what should, you kind of touched on it then, what should the government have been doing over the last six weeks? As opposed to now they're just saying you know, a week before we're going to start rolling out CO2 monitors. Yeah. And, and linking on to this, is there anything realistically? Because for me, it's only 
good enough for my children if there's not going to be transmission in school? Is that possible now with Delta? I don't, Lisa, I think while we would all want to say there shouldn't be any transmission, I think before Delta and during periods during this epidemic when we managed to get the community rate down very low, I think we could say with masks and with reasonable ventilation that we could, you know, pretty much say that we had reduced the transmission rate to, you know, a pretty, pretty low level. But that is not the case now. And I don't think, I, I don't think it will be possible until we get the infection rate down overall in the community. I don't think it would be possible to say that we could eliminate that risk. But you said, what should the government have been doing? And you all know what the government should have been doing. Since a year ago, the government should have um, engaged in, in a program of auditing ventilation in all schools, finding out where the problems were, putting in the mitigations, hiring more rooms, more space, so there could be fewer children in a room for shorter times, all that sort of thing. They should have been doing that. They should have been investing, investigating, upgrading, heating, um, air conditioning, and ventilation systems where they existed and putting in these systems that Dama was talking about and improving the filters in them and, and all the rest of it. And they should have been investigating putting HEPA filters into school and, and developing a range of high quality, good fit, good filtration, source control masks, free for absolutely everybody. I'm doing good messaging on this and making it clear that COVID was airborne and this is what we must be concentrating on rather than the theatre of hygiene and cleaning everything to within an inch of its life, putting far more hazardous quaternary ammonium bleach and other volatile organic chemicals into the air, which will be irritating all those children and staff and teachers and workers with, with um, asthma and respiratory problems and doing bugger all to actually reduce the risk. So they should have been doing all of that. But if they did a lot of that now, and if we improved ventilation and made sure we were keeping, we had enough ventilation to keep the level when the kids were in the classroom, to keep it down, the CO2 level below 800 parts per million, we, we would know we were at least doing something, but you must do everything and you must do as much of it as you possibly can because it won't all work. It is like that Swiss cheese model. It is that interlocking system of preventions where if it gets through one, it'll get caught by another. And you have to do all of those and you have to do them all the time. Yeah. Claire? Um, I was just going to come in with, um, especially as there's been a big study out in the last few days, it's come out from a place, um, a hospital called the Hôpital Timon in Marseille, a woman, a French, she's um, a paediatric epidemiologist called Dr Aurélie Morin, and she worked together with a nuclear medicine specialist called Dr Professor Eric Gage, and it's a big study of children and long COVID, and <clears throat> they basically found that a lot of the things were only literally only able to be seen by a CAT scan and a CAT scan with I did not mm. I'm not a nuclear medicine specialist but basically their figures the revised figures uh for children with long COVID is 17 percent and it's quite right. a big study yeah. it's quite it's yeah. a long-term study it's all yeah. online it were it, I, I got this from an article in Paris Match but um they've also found brain damage in these yes. children the oh, brain damage in these children same as the brain damage in the adults and yeah. when they were asked in this article about what they thought about children going back to school with delta they said they thought it was an extremely bad idea absolutely so it, that's, got, that's shocking that's a very that's a very shocking study and i think but i think and i think 17 percent of people i mean that's very very high i think we have to use all these sorts of things because the false dichotomy is children aren't going to die although we know as you said i think 75 children have died in the uk from covid and a 10,000 have been hospitalized and huge numbers you know, we think there might be one to two million people suffering with long COVID, but there will be more than that because of just what you've said, Claire, that we're not actually looking properly. And if you don't look, you won't find and you won't see. And, and so when they talk about 
it doesn't matter, children aren't mostly going to get that ill and they aren't going to die. That's not the point about schools. It's the point is, why would, how can we ethically subject them to mm -hmm. a disease we know could possibly harm them, might kill them, but also is going to, we're going to treat our schools and our school children like uh, breeding grounds for the next massive variant, which will undermine the vaccines, which are doing a good job and would have helped us to get rid of it if we hadn't have allowed it to be undermined. So we've, we've got to attack their, their false dichotomy and their lies on it. It's about the transmission. If kids get it, they're going to take it home to their families. We know that once it gets through that door, how could it not? How could it not get to every person in that household? And But then they, they turn that back on us and they say, oh, it's all coming from home. And it's, yeah. it's, absolute, it's absolute bollocks. It's where it came from work. During the lockdown, we practically got rid of it. And then when people went back to work and went back to school, suddenly it cropped up again. Well, it didn't come from home. It came from work and went back into home. And unfortunately, like the poorest areas are going to suffer the worst. The poorest absolutely. areas the worst housing, where people are living on top of each other. Absolutely. People have more public facing jobs. So the child will bring it home from school. The dad's a bus driver. The dad then shares it with the bus. Absolutely. And it goes on. And Absolutely. The That's the point to make. That's the point to make, Claire, isn't it? It's about the fact that it this the idea is that everything we've been trying to do to prevent. Well, they haven't tried to prevent it. I mean, the government's failed completely in an appalling way. And people all over the world are horrified at how Britain, which had the highest standards of uh, public health. You know, we, we taught people how to do this sort of stuff. And we actually had a gold star for our pandemic preparedness at one stage before they, they completely messed it up. Um, but you, you know, the, the point is, it, it, it's they, they claim that the preventions are what is devastating the economy. It's not. It's the bloody illness and the way they haven't got on top of it and they haven't suppressed it, which you're, you've explained it exactly. It will run through society. It will devastate everything. It will create chaos and destruction. But they've done it very carefully by they've put it all over to us. They've stopped doing anything and they've done what neoliberals always do, which is to transfer all the risks all the responsibility, all the blame, all the cost onto us as individuals, when this cannot be controlled without massive, major, national, collective controls and therefore co and collective preventions absolutely everywhere. Lisa, you want to come back in? Just um, going on from what you've said about how it affects children, I mean, what we're seeing just across the pond in the States is absolutely devastating. Um, I was chatting to um, a journalist and he said between the 12th and the 19th of August, 24 children had died in those in five days. How many days is that? Yeah. In just those few days, in, in a week, 24 kids had died. Um, you know, in the Southern Republican states in America, it, it's an absolute catastrophe. Uh, I made some notes before. Dr. Mark Klein from New Orleans is the fish, uh, physician in chief at the Children's Hospital. Uh, and he went on the telly and he was saying... This is an epidemic of very young children. This is not your grandfather's COVID. This yes. Delta variant is a new and unexpected challenge for us. He said the prevalence in children has gone from 1% to 20% in 30 days. Mm -hmm. He said it's children who are too young to be vaccinated are coming in in record numbers. Half of the children hospitalised are under two. And the, the, the vast majority of the other kids that are in are, are between five and ten. Again, the, the two, obviously, the, the too young to be vaccinated. He said this Delta variant is every infectious disease. I'm just quoting. It's not me. It's what he's saying. This Delta variant is every infectious disease specialist's worst nightmare. There was a myth that children were somehow immune. It has become very clear that children are heavily impacted. We are seeing more serious, more severe symptoms Children are coming in with respiratory failure and requiring mechanical ventilation. Now, if that is not a warning for what is going to happen here, and what is, you know, it's, it's already like we were saying before about in Scotland, you know, it's been it's gone up by 300 percent in Scotland. Um, the, the COVID rates. It's going to happen the same here, isn't it? And how we can just have this sense of complacent exceptionalism, you know, like somehow we can do things Bye. differently. Yeah, and, and I, I just think it's devastating. I was just reading articles before about, 
children who who had died a five year old and I hate saying this but I'm gonna and I'm gonna say it to it and then explain what I mean. So a little five year old called Rock Gibson uh from Georgia. He loved everybody. I mean he never met a stranger. Everything was fun. Um and he had no underlying health conditions. Now I, I hate it when people say that because it, it reeks of ableism but the reason I'm saying it is because people have this and the government wants to put this false perception is, oh, it affects other people. It affects old people. It affects people with an underlying health condition. No, it's Russian roulette for everybody. Nobody is immune or exempt. And, you know, this little lad's lost his life. And, and there's others. There's, I've written them down. Michaela Robinson, 13, Missy Zippy, died just one day after testing positive. The teacher wrote, it is with great sadness and a broken heart I announced the passing of one of my eighth graders. She was the perfect student. Every teacher loved, loved her and wanted 30 more just like her. These are people. Yeah. These are children. I, I don't know at what point. I mean, Boris Johnson said, let the fucking bodies pile high. Are we going to let the fucking bodies pile high of the kids as well? We're just numbers on a spreadsheet, Lisa. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. With this government, we're just numbers. And it's a numbers mm -hmm. game with them. They've decided 1,000 is the magic number, as like I said earlier on. It doesn't matter what age group these people come from. He's decided that 1,000 deaths a week is an acceptable price to pay to keep the country running because he values money more than lives. He's essentially put a price on each and every person in this country's life. I think it was 30 grand, they said. I read the article and I think, yeah, the, this figure that he'd come up with, this, he'd, he'd, he'd weighed up the, the cost benefit, the economic cost benefit. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's put a value on human life, essentially. And actually, this study that Clarence mentioned, I mean, the long COVID cases occurring in 17% of um, the, the, the children in that study, I mean, that is significantly higher than what was believed to be the case yes. before, which shows that was one thing how I didn't badly understood you. it is. There was one thing I didn't tell you. She didn't do it on any children with underlying conditions. These were children without prior oh, underlying Oh, my conditions. goodness me. That puts a Remove those and put those in a separate part of the study. These That's were incredible. children who had absolutely nothing yeah. wrong. Yeah. But I think just think that's another the, the issue. I mean, I think I'd like to see that cost benefit study because I think that's I would. Know, he's done it is completely wrong. I think just what just what Clarence talked about there. I mean, if really we're talking about 70 percent of children who had no underlying conditions, plus all the ones who did um, the, the cost of their health care and the, the loss of the immunity in their life, the loss of their achievement, all of that. We're talking about an incalculable amount of of heartbreak but also of actual physical cost mm -hmm. and the, the the disruption all those people who who, who can't get into hospital to get their non-covid illnesses treated is because of covid it's not because we insist on the mitigations it's because there aren't enough mitigations to mean that you can run a hospital and treat people mm -hmm. without COVID and make sure they don't get COVID on top of whatever they're suffering from. And those things are not coming out. They're not, they're, they're almost never discussed because we have, you know, thank God we've got socialist TV, Dama. We haven't got a, a, a proper public broadcasting system apart from, apart from Channel 4 and some other things. Most of the media and the BBC have become the propaganda arm of the government and there are unfortunately a huge number of paediatricians, shockingly, and other right. medical people who are willing to go on and, and spout an enormous lot of nonsense. Although there are lots of really good people also revealing the links they've got to the Great Barrington Declaration and the Koch brothers and a whole range of people. I mean, really, maybe, maybe this is all about, all about money in the sense that who wants COVID to go on forever? Well, the pharmaceutical industry will do very nicely out of it. The, the cost of endless tests, the cost of endless vaccines and all the rest of it. Perhaps they're the people who are, who are putting this. But the, the Conservatives' mates, uh, the corruption that's gone on, the pandemic profiteering has been absolutely astronomical. Lots of people are making a very great deal of money out of this.
Yeah, who's got shares in what company and uh, who's been bested yeah. in with who. I think yeah. the freedom of information request to uh, go in regarding that, uh, that advice that Boris Johnson is allegedly, yes. uh, those that costing, yeah. uh, I think definitely wants to be uh, put in. Many thanks for your time tonight, folks. We are unfortunately out of time. If you'd like to learn more about the work of the Hazards Campaign, do check out their website. Uh, hazardscampaign.org.uk and do give them a follow on Twitter as well. Their handle is at Hazards Campaign, nice and easy. <laughs> and Hilda, your handle is, I believe, at Hilda Palmer. So it certainly is. Well. <laughs> I know, I've got no imagination at all. <laughs> if you aren't already following Safe Ed, by the way, by episode six, my goodness me, what's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> on Twitter at, at Safe Ed for All underscore UK and Claire and Lisa are putting out some tremendous information and those epic videos, which no doubt will continue. So make sure you're following them too so you don't miss any of their rants at, at Claire Cosler and at Sandy Boots 2020. Many thanks for your time tonight, folks. It's 